Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Believe it or not, as we get into this case, uh, I am not picking on the state of Georgia or its Supreme Court, even though it may seem that way since we've had a couple of cases now. This is the second case involving the state of Georgia and its Supreme Court and what I think is a very bad decision. And indeed, the Supreme Court probably thought it was a bad decision because they took certiorari on it. So when things sort of show up in my feed, and I check the United States Supreme Court every week, and I check the Supreme Courts of the various states at least every other week, uh, maybe not all of them, but most of the ones that I'm interested in, I check uh, the ones that issue really good opinions, uh, that sort of thing. I, I look at those because there's always something interesting to talk about in those opinions. And so uh, when they show up and I, I look at it and I think, boy, that's important, I try to bring it to you guys. So that's what I have done here. This is McElrath versus Georgia, and it involves a horrible crime. A man with mental health issues tried very hard to get his point across. Now, if it hadn't been the point of a knife, and if only it hadn't been across his mother's body in multiple places multiple times, he might not have been tried for murder, but being crazy doesn't necessarily get you to go home free in Georgia. Now, as I've said on here before, for criminal defense attorneys, it is sometimes highly unlikely that you're going to get a win where your client is guilty as possible but walks away free. That's fairly rare. It's not unheard of. There are acquittals. Lori Phillips, I don't think she should have ever been charged, but Lori Phillips is one of those from Wisconsin. Acquittals on charges of murder are rare. There's no question about it. So many times, if there is really just no doubt that your client drove the point home, as he did here, and there really was no doubt in McElrath's case, you play for the lesser included instruction and an acquittal on the, the less, I'm sorry, an acquittal on the most serious charge. And that's a smart thing to do. It means that your client might get out of jail sometime before they're 80. The double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment generally says that the government gets only one chance to convict a defendant of crime. If a jury finds a defendant not guilty, then the government's lost its chance to convict that defendant of that offense. And that's been the law in the United States for two centuries. So on Tuesday of this week, SCOTUS heard argument on the McElrath versus Georgia case and Damian McElrath faced a number of serious charges. The most serious was malice murder, or what is basically murder one in Georgia. The jury found, on the one hand, that McElrath was not guilty by reason of insanity on malice murder, but he was guilty on the lesser included charge of felony murder, causing the death in the commission of a felony, and that he was guilty but insane. Now, Here's the problem with that verdict. First of all, the, the uh, defendant uh, appealed to the Georgia Supreme Court saying it was a, uh, a verdict that was repugnant and it was, it was so inconsistent that it needed to be reversed. And the state obviously had, a, had some words in that appeal and the Georgia Supreme Court held the jury's verdict of acquittal on one criminal charge and it's guilty on the two on the different charge arising from the same facts were logically and legally impossible to reconcile. It called the verdicts repugnant. It vacated both of them and subsequently held that the defendant could be prosecuted a second time on both charges. In other words, instead of crediting the acquittal on malice murder, one charge, the court threw out the entire verdict, calling it inconsistent. So. Here is the question presented. The Georgia Supreme Court held that a jury's verdict of acquittal on one criminal charge and its verdict of guilty on a different criminal charge arising from the same facts were logically and legally impossible to reconcile. It called the verdicts repugnant, vacated both of them, and subsequently held that the defendant could be prosecuted a second time on both charges. Does the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment prohibit a second prosecution 
for a crime of which a defendant was previously acquitted. Here is what the Fifth Amendment actually says. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to twice be put in jeopardy of life or limb, in other words, the double jeopardy provision, nor shall he be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. That is the full Fifth Amendment. So obviously, ordinarily, the acquittal on the most serious charge would essentially mean that you could never be retried on that, and that Georgia could never try McElrath again on, mal on malice murder. But in the civil trial context, juries get confused and return inconsistent verdicts all the time. It happened to me once. I had a sexual harassment and age discrimination case where a teacher had been very badly treated by two assistant principals, and they had gone around the school talking about how they were going to get rid of the old dead wood, which they viewed as any teacher over 50 years old. At the trial, the jury issued a verdict that on one count found for the plaintiff but awarded no damages. That was the count that would have allowed them to award punitive damages. They awarded smaller damages on the other count that would not have supported punitive damages. Then they issued a special finding, a special jury instruction was given to them, saying that they found clear and convincing evidence supporting punitive damages. And, of course, when all of the lawyers and the judge looked at that, we went, huh? So, despite objections from the defense in that case, the judge instructed them that if they wanted to award punitive damages, they had to award it in the right count and sent the jury back. And that's what the judge did. He sent them back, and after explaining their mistake, the jury returned a reformed verdict that properly awarded damages and after another oral argument, imposed significant punitive damages on that school district. So inconsistent verdicts and the judge's ability to order renewed deliberation in a civil case is nothing new. But the Fifth Amendment does not impact civil trials, at least not directly. And the judge's refusal to accept a verdict in a civil case occurs before the jury is discharged. In other words, they don't discharge the jury and then call them back. So... As you might imagine, the Supreme Court was having none of this double jeopardy stuff uh, and spanked the Attorney General from Georgia like an errant schoolboy. Now, we know what the defendant is going to say, that there is, you know, no way this can stand under double jeopardy. What's interesting is to listen to the Attorney General for the state of Georgia lay out his rationale for why this should be okay. General Petrani? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Petitioner Damian McElrath assumes again and again that there was a verdict in this case, but that's simply not true according to state law as determined by Georgia's highest court. Under Georgia's narrow, sensible repugnancy rule, a jury cannot issue special affirmative findings that facially contradict each other. These incoherent, contradictory statements do not constitute a verdict in the first place. They don't resolve the factual inquiry. In practice, this rule means a jury cannot declare a man both sane and insane at the exact same time with respect to the exact same act as the jury purported to do here. That's why the Georgia Supreme Court held there was no verdict, no acquittal, and no convictions. Justice Thomas was not having any of this. Uh, if you only had one charge here, malice murder, uh, would there have been a verdict? Well, I suppose it depends on what the jury comes back with. Well, but just yes. everything is the same except it's only one charge. Yeah, in that case, you would you would have a verdict. So if that's if this constitutes a verdict, if there were only one, why does it not constitute a verdict when there are two? Because Georgia does not ascribe to the legal fiction that the jury is finding different facts when they're looking at the exact same no, That's fact. not what it's, it's so. You have a verdict, 
uh, you say that if there if it's only malice murder that we're concerned about, that you would have a verdict here. If that was yes, if that was all that was in the case, if that was the only thing going on, yeah, I don't. And see just anything. everything in the case is exactly the same, except there's only one charge. Yeah. Would this constitute a verdict? Yeah, I think under Georgia law as it exists today, that that, that would be a verdict. Yes. So the problem is that up to that point, until you void the verdict, you have what constitutes a verdict. It's not procedurally defective. There's not a jurisdictional problem. You have a verdict that is subsequently voided because it's inconsistent with a separate charge. And I don't know how you get around the notion, and and that requires you, by the way, to look at the substance of the verdict. And I don't know how you get around the notion that before you can do that, there actually is a verdict. And Justice Gorsuch wasn't taking any of this lying down either. He had some really interesting points to make along the way. Just looking through the briefs, I didn't see another state that has a scheme like Georgia's that allows an acquittal to be rendered invalid based on its repugnancy with other guilty um, verdicts. Is that correct? As far as I'm aware, there's no state that has addressed this particular issue, Your Honor. I mean, these are rare circumstances. It's not ordinary for a jury to issue special findings on a particular I'm, issue I'm, I'm, I'm going both ways. But yes, you speaking, are as far as I know, there's no other state it. that has addressed this issue at all. Now, shouldn't that tell us something? That 230 years in this, in this country's history, we have respected acquittals without looking into their substance and without looking into how they fit with other counts, and said, a jury is a check on judges. It's a check on prosecutors. It's a check on overreach. It's part of our democratic system. And we do not ever talk about whether they make sense to us. They may be products of compromise. They may be inconsistent with verdicts on other counts. We don't question them. And this is the first time this issue has arisen here. Shouldn't that tell us something? Whenever I go into an oral argument and the client happens to sit in on that oral argument, I always tell them, look, you really can't tell very much about what the court's going to do by the questions they ask. Sometimes they're throwing the other guy a lifeline when it looks like they're trying to help you. And sometimes they're throwing you a lifeline when it looks like they're trying to hurt you. So, You have to be careful about analyzing where a court is going to come down on the basis of the questions that are asked at oral argument. That's the general rule. (laughs) I've gone through the transcript here, and I have to tell you, there is no way that the court is not going to reverse this verdict. It is a patently ridiculous verdict, and, and the assertions made by the attorney general here they just they lack clarity on so many issues and so many points that it goes beyond anything that I have seen in terms of an oral argument. As I often say, when I first started at the Missouri Supreme Court as a clerk, I came expecting on that first day of oral argument to see grand oratory of the, you know, Daniel Webster, you know, maybe somebody like uh, Perry Mason, you know, so at least somebody who knew how to argue and do a good job. But unfortunately, many arguments are just like this. People get up and say stupid things. It, it's just the way life works. So I don't necessarily think all of the guy's points were wrong. The idea that you can trump an acquittal is ridiculous. Juries are designed to be a check on prosecutors, and that's always been the case. And in point of fact, when you think about it, Georgia actually dodged a bullet here, or a knife blade if you prefer. The state charged aggravated assault, malice murder, and felony murder because aggravated assault is a felony. There is a felony on which felony murder can be charged. If they had not charged aggravated assault and instead had just charged malice murder and the jury found no malice murder, hence no felony, he would have been acquitted completely because without a felony, you can't have felony murder. So that's what I have for you today. But Today, in sort of one of my kindness moments here, I want to talk about my pals in the United States Marine Corps. Now, I was in the Army, and there is sort of a natural tension between the Marines and the Army, but it's good-natured. If you talk to anyone who served in the Army, like me, you'll find they are very glad they did not serve in the Marines, because 
The Marines get all the really bad jobs. When they talk about being the few, the proud, the Marines, they should be. But they do get all of the bad jobs, so I have a lot of respect for my brethren in the Marines. How does that relate to kindness, you must be asking? Well, one of the things the Marine Corps Reserve does is it sponsors Toys for Tots every year. Now, Toys for Tots is a thing where they gather up and distribute toys at Christmas to low-income children. So if you are at Target or Walmart or browsing on Amazon and you see a nice toy for not a lot of money, consider buying and donating it to Toys for Tots. That would be a very kind thing for you to do. God bless you all. Thanks for watching. Have a terrific day. Then come back here tomorrow and catch me down at the beach. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.